just wanted to quickly introduce everybody to Pink Creek Center for the Arts. We're a nonprofit organization here in Rochester, Michigan, and exhibitions uh, is one of the many programs that we run here. We also um, run art education programming, which if you're downstairs, you see our art education classes going on, as well as an art market in the lobby and our, the Art and Apples Festival here in Rochester um, that we do each fall. So, um, anyways, I want to welcome everybody, and I'm going to introduce Jenny Creech, our manager of exhibitions, to start the questions and uh, the discussion with the artist. Awesome. Thank you guys for coming. The weather is not the best. <laughs> um, so, we're just going to start with a really simple introduction. So, if you just want to say your name and where you're from. Uh, my name is Jeremy Allen, and I am from the greater Detroit metro area. I grew up in Troy, so cool. not too far away from here. My name is Joy McKelvin, and I'm from Waterford and grew up in Pontiac. My name is Chantel Vincent. I'm originally from Fairbanks, Alaska, and now reside in Dearborn Heights, Michigan. So many of you are new exhibiting artists. Um, you either primarily do shows or you have work in art markets and things like that, so the exhibition is a little bit new for you. Um, for those in attendance who don't know you, um, can you briefly explain um, with your artistic background? Um, so I'm currently in school at the College for Creative Studies and my focus is more in product design or industrial design um, and I really was missing like the tangibleness of furniture or art itself um, so I, I am minoring in art furniture and the focus of what I'm doing is really about the people that are interacting with the pieces that I'm making um, so understanding the furniture itself and the scenario in which users would be like experiencing it and trying to design it and create a piece that's like functional to the point where it enhances everybody's like daily lives and the moments that they're sharing with each other. So I'm self-taught. I did not go to school or fashion school or anything like that. I was um, just started sewing when I was very young. I would use my mom's sewing machine and um, just start making like Barbie doll clothes and stuff like that and just kind of grew into um, making handbags. And I went to the same kind of school. I, I um, grew up with uh, my grandmother and my aunt being very into crafting and um, my aunt and grandmother both crocheted so I was taught that and later in life I picked it back up and kind of grew from there. Can you speak a little bit about the work that you exhibited for this mission? So maybe um, what is it about the medium that you enjoy working with and how you kind of created this for these pieces? Um, so most of the pieces, if not all of the pieces I have in the show are made of wood. Um, the thing I really like about the material is there's like a rich history of its use throughout like all civilizations and you're able to like choose specific woods for specific purposes. Uh, like one of my pieces was like rooted in my history growing up in Michigan, being surrounded by like arts and crafts and mid-century modern, so using like oak relates itself to the people in the environment that are like experiencing the, the pieces I make. So wood just kind of lends itself to be a, a unique material that just has a lot of history and it ages and develops with you. So. My medium is fiber, and what I use is, is called cork, which comes from the cork oak tree in Portugal. And I just like love the aspect of it being vegan and eco-friendly and very renewable. The cork oak trees regenerate themselves every nine years, so a tree can grow or actually live for as long as 300 years. Um, my medium is also fiber. Uh, I mostly work um, with wools and wool blends. Um, what I love about crochet, the technique of crochet, uh, is being able to actually make something with an old world skill. Um, I'm fascinated by old world skills in general, so um, texture and function is very like ingrained in me just growing up in Alaska. So uh, function when I'm designing something is my first priority. And it needs to be something that can last for a long time and be wearable. So it's awesome. It's like the whole exhibition just sum up. Just, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Done. <laughs> 
Um, so, like I had mentioned a little bit earlier, many of you guys are um, professional artists, so you work full-time working on artwork. Um, a few of you are also traveling almost year-round for festivals and fairs. Can you kind of speak to what your experiences as a full-time artist have been, or your transition from um, just part-time or doing this as a hobby, and now it's a business for you? I can. I can talk about it. Um, so. When I, when I first started doing uh, Mitten Made, my aesthetic was way different. It was very much about change purses and small things and um, kind of wait, wait, tchotchke -like type things. And it wasn't so much um, focused on, like I didn't really have a clear view of what I was trying to do. And over the years, um, my aesthetic has changed and um, I've really been able to partner with a lot of other artists that shows, get inspired by other artists that shows, not just people in fiber, but people across the board in all different mediums, and really kind of pull from them the kind of talk and, and inspiration to really move me forward. So it's been a very good experience overall for me. I mean, in general, so, yeah. Um, I work full-time, and I do my art full-time. Uh, soon I'm quitting my job, which is going to be really exciting and scary <laughs> at the same time. Um, I will say art shows and exhibits and having your stuff in galleries are it's very exciting. Um, I just love to create, and it actually makes me happy. Um, it can be hard work, uh, but the end result is very rewarding selling your product or your item to the um, to the media or medium or people is just really um, fun and rewarding. Would you say that you've seen a difference between when you started and your interactions with customers to now? Yes, I yeah. would say so. Um, I would Because I started out with cork and maybe fabric um, and I've gone more towards um, being more um, like, in the, like looking at fashion industry and seeing what they have out there, their colors, the shapes, um, looking more professional. Uh, my experience is a little bit different. So this is the second exhibition I've been in. Uh, I'm a full-time student in a field that's different than this. Mm -hmm. um, so being able to display my work to like a different audience is really fun for me. And, uh, just kind of getting exposure into the art world, not only just like the design world, it just has an influence, like design is influencing my art, but then the art that I'm seeing and the inspiration that I see on a daily basis influence my design. So it's just like a good combination of both. Yeah, that's perfect. So our whole exhibition series here has been themed around like a future in the art and careers in the arts. Mm -hmm. um, so I think uh, the three of you in particular um, these are not pieces that you normally see in an exhibition space, so I am personally very excited to see us get to highlight some careers that don't always get yeah. brought up when someone says, I'm an artist. They don't necessarily right. think about someone working in fiber and wood, but right. those are absolutely arts. Yes. Um, so my last question for you guys before we open it up to the floor um, is, if you have any, um, what would be your one piece of advice for someone who is looking to either maybe start working with your medium or who maybe is looking to start creating functional artwork? Who wants to go first? I would say just um, believe in yourself and um, just keep going forward. And it can be hard, it can be difficult. Um, some people might not like your stuff, but that's okay. There's um, lots of people out there that will. And, and um, just, just believe in your dream and just try to do it. Um, I would say my one piece of advice would be to master your tension when working with the art, um, but also to uh, just ensure that you're really talking to the people that inspire you. Because for me, part of my inspiration comes from my customers, so it's really important to listen to them. When you're making something functional, you need someone to wear it. <laughs> so it needs to be realistic, um, and all the other fun stuff, you know, how pretty it is or whatever else will, will naturally come. But to really listen to your customers and, and the people that you're working with and selling to, what they really are looking for. Yeah, I would say 
for me, the most important thing or two would be one to get inspired. Um, it comes from almost anywhere. Uh, the, one of my furniture pieces was inspired by like a table I had in my house growing up. Um, another was inspired by a painting of an astronaut. So it's just like you're able to take things that aren't within your medium and apply them and have them drive like a project. Uh, and the second would just be to create to just keep making things, um, even if it didn't go as like you planned it, to just like make another one and make another one. Even if you are gonna mess up, everything's just like a, an exploration of the material or the form or um, the design. So even if the first one's bad, even if the 20th one's bad, the only way to get better will be to do it. So be prolific, make some work. <laughs> make some work, I like it. Um, were there any questions? How many of you ever get like artist block, like just cannot think, like what, how do you beat that? I know that a lot of times, I think it's because I work full time and I'm um, doing my art right now. I just don't want to do anything, like I don't want to sew anymore, I need a break. And, um, but then I like will scroll Instagram or go on Pinterest or look at an artist site and it gets my juices flowing and I'm like going, oh, I have to go ahead and go downstairs and start sewing. So we do get the blocks, but I just try to find something that's going to inspire me to start again. Um, I think for me, I, I talk it out. I, that sounds a little strange, but uh, when I'm designing something and thinking of something, I have a very clear picture in my brain of what I'm trying to make. It doesn't always translate onto paper for a design and in my hands. So it, I, I use my friends, I use my husband to talk to them about what I'm trying to do, and it might take a long time. I mean, my simplest thing I make is a beanie, and it took me three years to design a beanie, like the most simplest thing you could think of. But in my brain, I have this very clear picture of what I was trying to make, and talking it out, and talking it out, and try, trial and error over and over again, I pushed through it. But I couldn't make anything else for three years until I figured out that one day. <laughs> so silly, but yeah, so that's that's how I get through it. Yeah. I think what drives me is like the next project. I'm usually like pretty over my project, like three quarters of the way through it. And then the next one is like one I'm already like thinking of. So then like the will to continue just comes from like knowing that it will be done eventually and that there's something cool and exciting coming. Well, I was wondering about, wondering what you think about your work in relation to Produce functional objects in terms of the aesthetics or any other ideas you have about that? I think that's always a struggle with items because people, I mean, I can't tell you how many times where people come into my tent and tell me, I can't believe this is this much, I can go to wherever and purchase it um, for this amount of money, or they'll try to haggle you or talk you down on your pricing, and it's, it's, slightly offensive when you hear those things, but you also have to understand where they're coming from um, and in relation where my work really fits into their life. My work doesn't fit into their life, and it's not going to fit into everyone's life. Um, a lot of times things are mislabeled in stores, and they'll say that items are crocheted. There's no such thing as a crochet machine, and no one is paying anyone to crochet for a million hours like that's impossible so it's not technically those things so they have a different idea of what my, personally my work is um, and that's that's definitely a struggle I feel like having handmade things um, handcrafted things or old world made things uh, is very important and I feel everyone should have something it's, for crochet specifically, it's not just Afghans. Like people think crochet and they think of the 60s when everybody had granny square everything, you know? And um, my goal is to really show them something different and something else um, that is still functional because everyone still has their granny square blankets at home. <laughs> like everyone mm -hmm. still has this because they, they never fell apart and everybody still loves them. Grandma made it, you know, Nana was the best. I kind of get the same thing because cork is actually coming everywhere now and people don't realize um, most of the court comes from Portugal and 
Uh, the better grade cork is more pliable. It's like leather, it's durable, it's wearable. Um, some places like stores are carrying it, but they're getting their cork and it's thinner. If you see the fabric, you can see through it. So I just, um, and then the quality is not there either that you would get with um, maybe a handmade or handmade item from an artist. I think uh, my background in like industrial design or product design, uh, it's influencing the work that I'm doing in like art furniture. Uh, the table I have in the show, for instance, um, the top of it's actually CNC, so it's all 3D modeled in a program, taken to a CN like five S access CNC machine, cut out to be exactly what I wanted it to be, and then it's all scalable. So integrating like the idea of manufacturing into the design is really useful, um, and that allows it to in theory one day be produced to the scale where like it might end up in like a higher end like art store or like uh, like a MoMA store for instance like that was kind of the target I was going for with the design of that table specifically and having it be something that anybody can relate to uh, and that makes sense with inside of their lives so everything in my opinion is about like the experiences you have with people and the experiences you have with the world and if you can express that through a design, through, for the table, for instance, bringing people together over a communal meal. And every aspect of that design gets them there easier and reduces the stress so they can focus more on like the moments that they're sharing opposed to like the noise that surrounds them um, is really important. So being able to give that to as many people as possible is nice, but still to have that touch of like handcrafted, the legs are turned and, um, but in integrating both like manufacturing techniques as well as um, traditional techniques is like really useful. How do you decide or which pieces you're going to keep? When you're doing certain things, you make and you know right away like I'm going to keep this for the family member. Or oh, I just things. made this recently, and I'm keeping this. <laughs> <laughs> I love this. <it. laughs> I love this. Um, yeah, I mean, there's. Um, Sometimes it's really hard. I'll, sometimes I'll be at a show and I'll have all my pieces out. And, you know, to help sell your pieces, you'll put something on or whatever, and then I'll be sending them. And you're looking at myself, I really like this. <laughs> I think I'm going to keep this. And then I find it back home with me. Um, but most of my pieces, actually, I make for someone. It used to be my husband, then it turned into making things for my dog, and then ideas and things like that would start to build and I'd be like, you know, maybe I could do something like this. Uh, the little sweater that you see over there on the wall is, um, I made those for my twins and that's how I originally designed it, which is for my boys. And then I was like, I wonder if this is something that I could do and would it be cost effective? Would it be cost effective for my customers? Would it be cost effective? You know, so you just start thinking outside those it, for me personally, it always starts with family and friends, and then it kind of you know, moves from there. I usually keep my first piece, um, my prototype, uh, and then I will, um, if I did a boo-boo or the zipper's on the wrong side, they should be going on both sides. I usually keep those ones, the mistake ones. <laughs> I'm getting to the point where I'm not like attached to my work, so I like other people to have it. Uh, I think exposing yourself to people outside of like the realm of like your day-to-day -day life is really useful. I think that's like a like I want my art to be the spark of like a conversation like sitting on somebody's table in their dining room and then they're like what is this and then they can tell a story because it's all about experiences people want to like tell a story based off of like this artist they met or this cool design based off of something so I think expanding outside the people you know is useful, but also keeping some for yourself. Being able to enjoy your artwork um, is also really useful. So. Thank you guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for having us.